Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Critical Reactions with your host, Brian. We have two videos to go left in this great orchestral instrument use in non-classical music theme, which is just a terrible theme name, but it's a great theme. We've actually seen some really cool stuff this week, seeing classical instruments being used in rock and metal both in new inventive ways and also utilizing them in their classical ways in new contexts of music. It's been a fantastic journey so far. I'm really interested in moving on and seeing what else we have throughout this week as well. Before we start in today's reaction, I just want to remind everybody, if you could, like, subscribe, and ring the bell. Today we're checking out a song called Disembodiment by uh, Shade Empire. And uh, this is another band that I have never heard of, which is just so bizarre. I mean, I, I check every comment. I watch the music channel in Discord. I see what everybody's listening to and talking about and sharing, even if I don't get around to listening to every song. And sometimes I choose not to listen to songs just because I know that there's a reaction coming up of, you know, the band or something like that. Um but yeah, it's another Shade Empire. I've, I've never seen those words together in any comment. In I don't even think they're in a the spreadsheet. Maybe they are. Um, there's We've passed like 1,300 bands in that spreadsheet, so I can't remember all of them. But yeah, so this isn't ringing any bells. They only have 700 subscribers, so they're a smaller band, and I'm excited to get into this. we got a 13-minute epic ahead of us, so grab some water. Get a light snack, maybe some, uh, some, uh, you know, a fruit or something, and let's get into this. Yeah, a lot of energy. We got some rising tension. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's a French horn. Really great choice for that lead right there. Adding more layers with every repetition. louder than I was expecting given the volume of the uh, orchestral instruments but definitely makes an entrance. Yeah. Gorgeous transition. Butter. Yeah, so I, I initially thought this might have transitioned to 6-8, but I think it's just uh, triplets inside of 4-4. Four, four.
Okay, so this feels like six again, so... Yeah, some really interesting polyrhythms here. Yes, yes, those strings, the string stingers. Doing a dotted quarter pattern, so you got on the beat and off the beat. violins are utilized with those eighth notes to create like a head bottom motion. A little bit of ornamentation in that violin line now. Drummer's just beast mode. Yeah, so we talked about the, uh, earlier, uh, last week I think it was about a 2D, and this is it. That section was a 2D. T-U-T-T-I. Yeah. Real strong groove coming from the guitar. They would each have their own peaks alternating each other as far as pitch was going. Regardless of everything else, just because of those uh, pickup notes, those little grace notes. Yeah, and I really love this combination of electronica with the classical stuff because you get that like really wavy synth 
going against some of the lower end stuff in the orchestra and it just sounds amazing. And the hi-hat part just can transition to the bass kicks. And I'm pretty sure that was done because the high end has a lot of uh, sound right now and the low end is a little sparser so that rhythm can come out a lot clearer in the kicks than it can in the high end. The mixing on the drums is superb. The way that the cymbals are panned just makes the song feel so large, especially with the, uh, or the orchestral elements present as well. Yeah, so we got some stick clicks going on. I think I hear a timpani, and then there is a digital percussionist, percussionist, percussionistic sound. <laughs> I can't think of that word. Percussion sounds. It's that nice synth. Yeah, and again, just this nice mix between classical uh, instrumentation and modern synth work to create some beautiful atmosphere. Listen to the two lines, the choir and the guitar work, and the notes and how they're overlapping with each other. Yeah, I don't have time for a uh, analysis breakdown. I'm just going to end the video and go listen to this whole album. See you guys later. <laughs> uh, of course, we're going to get into an analysis, but I mean, God, if there's a band that's going to get me into growls, this might be it. <laughs> just because I would be forced to listen to them for long periods of time just to enjoy the phenomenal composition. I mean, 
Golly. I'm I'm not gonna lie. I was I was listening critically, analytically, orchestral listening, if you will, is the proper term. Uh, to this song as much as I could, but there was plenty of times when I just turned the brain off and jammed because it's just written so well. I don't want to decompose it. I don't want to figure out that magic. I just want to live in this music. It is, oh man, it's so good. I'm just going to spend the next 15 minutes gushing about this. I apologize if I go on any tangents that aren't exactly critical and are just kind of fanish because that was phenomenal. I tried to fit like phenomenal and uh, it just wasn't going to work. <laughs> um, yeah, well, uh, who are these Shade Empire? How come I have not heard of this before? There is there is a chance it's popped up in the Discord and then it would just be my fault for not having listened to them but I gotta look real quick like I know I should be doing the reaction and doing the analysis but uh okay so last year we got talking about Demu Borgir and uh, Thoughts of Decay mentioned that they also really like Shade Empire if you want a better version of Demu Borgir. And that is the only mention in my entire Discord. Uh, let, let's see if it's in the... I don't... <laughs> I'm so interested in how often this... And it's never been mentioned in the YouTube channel chat. Or the YouTube comments. Um... Yep, uh, so it's not exactly my fault I haven't heard them yet. Uh, where do I even start? Okay, so like I said, I wasn't exactly critically listening for the entire song. Sometimes I just got into that pure enjoyment and just really God, I just enjoyed it. Right, got into the moment and just jammed out with it because my brain just did not want to think. It just wanted to really get into it. So, yeah, I guess I'm going to be talking about this in a little bit more general sense than some of the shorter songs just because it is such a dense track to break down each section would take quite a bit of time. Um, and then to wrap that all up into a cohesive analysis that's just it's too long for the video and too much musical content for my brain to remember in a single sitting a single listen so this is going to be a bit more of a, a general sort of uh, analysis here and I hope that's okay because I can't really give anything else <laughs> um, the only thing that I think we can really talk about here is their composition techniques and there's a couple that continue to pop up over and over again. I can't believe that it wouldn't be such a core aspect of their composition writing as a group. I don't know how large of a group this is. I don't know if the uh, orchestra elements are digital, which they very well could be. I noticed at the beginning with the uh, French horn section that the French horn solo at the beginning sounded to me to be very digital. It lacked just a little bit of that human quality and all of the notes were sort of um, faded out while the next one started which removed any sense of real hard stops uh, and without the hard stops you lose those breathing elements and while it could be an entire French horn section in which case they can trade off breaths to remove that it did feel very synthetic. Now, of course, every part of my criticism for believing that it's uh, a digital orchestra could also just be editing tricks. Uh, like I said, one of the big things is the fact that it doesn't, each note seems to be individually mixed um, and they're tapered off 
before the next one's introduced, that's entirely a mixing thing. That's, that's engineering. You could do the same thing with a live band. Um, and then the humanness, I mean, if you have a full group, it's very easy to erase some of the more human errors that you get while playing. So, I mean, it's, it's very, it, it could be that this is a, a real orchestra and just a lot of modern editing techniques to make it feel more like a modern genre edit rather than, or a modern genre mix rather than more of a classical mix. Um, but yeah, I would, I would put my bets on it being digital and I've talked about that before. I don't have a problem with it per se. It sounds fine. Um, but I, I do enjoy seeing musicians get the chance to play and have gigs, uh, available. I feel like as we continue, uh, on in this direction, we're going to end up seeing less and less musician gigs because so many elements of musicians work can almost indistinguishably indistinguishably be done digitally and a lot of people are choosing to do so on the flip side i also know orchestras are expensive and you can't tour with them so there are you know there's benefits to both sides but as a musician i do enjoy seeing musicians actually get to play uh, with that aside, though, that's more of some personal stuff. Let's get into the analysis of the track. Now, I mentioned the composition is going to be the big thing. And to me, there's a couple ideas that crop up time and time again. And one of them is counterpoint. Multi-level counterpoint at times. These guys know how to have multiple melody lines running simultaneously um at very high volumes everybody's really fighting for some space but they they do it so eloquently where everybody kind of gets their shot i mentioned uh one of the easiest times to see this would be at the guitar solo and there's a violin playing behind it and they have alternating peaks so when the guitar starts to play higher notes the violin starts to play lower notes and when the violin starts to rise the guitar starts to lower and they have these alternating valleys and peaks as far as their ranges go, which alternates typically spotlight. Uh, most human ears, I believe, tend to uh, gravitate towards uh, more of the higher notes. And so them alternating like that allows each of them to trade off the spotlight so that they both their parts can be heard equally. And it comes together in a phenomenal melody. Um, it's not a hocket, but it's a dual melody creating a single idea, and yeah, it just it came together so well. And they take that idea, and they extrapolate it to like three and four tier melodies at times, and it is just phenomenal composition work to be able to have so many moving parts. Some of them repeated, loop based, riff based, however you want to say it, and some of them linear moving from beginning to end without looping parts between them um, and just to keep everything in check and making sure that everybody is you know getting out of each other's ways when they have more of a spotlight section to the melody line making sure that there's gaps uh, you know rests for some instruments when others need a little bit more room it's just done so well and I have to wonder if whoever composed this, whether it is one person in the group or maybe a few people or maybe the entire band, uh, how many of them have classical composition training? How many of them grew up on classical music? Um, because, I, uh, yes, there are prodigies, and I'm sure that there's a couple of people in the world who can just pick up on ideas like this, like it's it's just innate to them. But the majority of people are going to have to practice to get to this level and really, you know, go through the motion, go, go through the motions, go through the training of failure, creating things that don't work, creating multiple lines that sort of fail and fall apart because there's too much going on in certain spaces to get to the point where they can write something like this that is just immaculate on every level at every second. Um... It is just a wonderful display of 
expertise. It is a flex in classical composition. Um, well, at least a flex in, in counterpoint, counter melody. Um, so yeah, that is definitely one strength of the band. That, that idea crops up all throughout this track. Um, another one that comes up all over the place is theme and variation. There are several lines that get repeated throughout the song. Uh, I don't think there is a single theme that exists throughout from beginning to end. It would be really cool. Maybe I missed it. It's very possible. It's a 13 minute song. Uh, and first time listening. So I'm not going to pick up on everything. But there were definitely plenty of sections where one instrument would play a line and pass it on to another instrument. Uh, and maybe the second instrument might play it word for word, so to speak, note for note. Or maybe they might change a little bit, uh, add a little bit of embellishment, maybe do something that their instrument does better than the previous one. Um, and yeah, this this just happened all over the place. If you've got a keen ear, I'm sure there's Easter eggs all over this song <laughs> uh, regarding old lines popping back up. And it is a fantastic way to reuse lines. If you've written a really strong line um, and you just love it, you could put it in just the first 30 seconds of the song and never use it again. And there's definitely times to do that. But to me, I tend to enjoy reu uh, reusing stuff, recycling ideas, if you will. Um, and it doesn't have to be a direct copy and paste. You can take an idea you've used and turn it upside down. You can rearrange the first and the second half. There's so many different ways that you can create variation on a single idea. But if it if you really love an idea, put it everywhere in your song for real. Um, you know, add some grace notes, add a pickup note, change uh, instead of a, a quarter note run, put a 16th note run in there. If you have an instrument that might do a little better at it, uh, maybe the fingerings. I, there's <laughs> one of the things I learned as a composer is one of the first things I, I learned uh, when I was back doing uh, composition in, in university was that trumpet... <laughs> is pretty easy to play notes. The, the, big, the big difficulty with trumpet is mostly octave gaps because that's all embouchure almost. Uh, trumpet, especially once you get past the sort of the lowest range that you can go, there is, a, there is an octave below it, but most players can only play half of that. To get to like the low C, you really got to work on your embouchure for that. Again, embouchure pops up. But once you get above the staff, the top half of the staff, and then above, a lot of that is just open and the first valve. Uh, that's that's really it as far as um, your your bass notes, no sharps, no flats. So a lot of how you get to the higher notes is all in how you position your lips and how you hold them and the shape you're making. Um, so moving between octaves gets really difficult with trumpets. Um, and one of the first pieces I wrote uh, when I was doing comp one, I wrote for a uh, tenor sax duet. And I wrote a line that would have been fairly easy to play on um, guitar. And on trumpet, those were the two things that I, I knew how to play. Kind of stuck within a, a general octave. Uh, so, you know, on a guitar, that's real simple. It's all about, uh, you know, the precision of the fingers because you're not going to be moving your hand much. And on a trumpet, your embouchure can pretty much stay the same. It's all, again, about the fingers. But on a tenor, uh, yeah, the tenor sax, the fingerings for some of these were just way too complex to move between at the speed that I wanted them to. Um, so there's, there's definitely something that you need to learn as a composer is that every instrument has its strengths and weaknesses, and a lot of it comes from how they're played. Um, and I don't even remember. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Talking about, uh, theme and variation. So there's, every instrument kind of has different things that it can do easier than other instruments. That's not to say it can't do it. I could have found a very professional, expert-level 
uh, saxophonist who could have played the line I've written. It's not like it was impossible on the instrument. It was just a great deal more difficult than the instruments I had in mind when I originally wrote the piece because of what I played. So, um, yeah, so you can even do that where you take some of the elements that are maybe the instrument has an easier time with and throwing that in when you bring an idea back. There's lots of ways to take a single idea and revisit it without it seeming stale or repetitive or copy-pasted. Um, but yeah, these, these guys are just, again, masters at revisiting old ideas, bringing them back, tossing them into new instruments. The one that really stood out to me is probably because it was back-to-back -back, um, and it was so unusual was that jazzy hi-hat run. And I, I called this out when I was listening to it. Um, it stood out to me clear as day. It is a perfect example. Uh, he brings it in, and it is just this super jazzy hi-hat. It has all these, like, 16th notes prior to the beat, so you get these little pickups, like, ta-ta, 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 ta-ta. And, yeah, and so it gives this section sort of a, a bright, poppy, uplifting kind of feel to it. Very jazzy, very dancey huge departure from the almost march-like element seen throughout the the rest of the song and in the very next section uh that that section was very sparsely uh laid out with instruments it was one of the quieter sections when they brought everything back in the high end now had a lot of uh you know instruments vying for it. we brought the violins back in uh, i think the guitars were playing up there again um, it was a lot, it was, it was full. So now we have the bottom end of the, the range that is a little more empty where this rhythm could be brought out. And so they throw it into the bass kicks. And once again, it completely changes the feel without the brightness of the uh, hi-hat. It doesn't feel so dancey anymore. There's a lot more weight and oomph and punched to the rhythm. Um, and it kind of gives it more of a like a punk feel for a moment just because of that bass kick but they reutilize an idea in a completely new context with a new timbre and it it kept the song lively it kept it fresh and there was i mean it's just yeah i love that like i said theme and variation take an idea you've already used iterate on it change it up somehow move it to a different instrument and just keep it rolling and they did this all the time it was just so cool to, you know, see that happen. I, I don't know if it's because rock and metal bands have mostly similar instruments. The bass and the guitar are very similar in timbre. It's really their, their range. I mean, the guitar and the bass are the same instrument, just with thicker, uh, you know, thicker strings on a bass. And, you know, little things. You, you got your pickups and your bass amps, and there's there's little differences, but... For the most part, they're stringed instruments that you uh, pluck either with a pick or your finger. So they're very similar. Your vocalist is a little different. And sometimes we do see trade-offs between vocals and guitars. I, I've picked up on that in a few songs. Um, but the drums can't really contribute too much on a melodic or harmonic level. So it might just be the lack of variety in timbre and texture of why this concept doesn't pop up too much in traditional rock and metal setups. But yeah, I am so glad to see them utilize stuff like this when they have the larger instrument set. It's just, yeah, just so good. I, I, I'm curious how this came to be. Did this person have a strong background in, you know, classical writing? And they also loved metal music and the band started out doing this. Or is this an evolution over time where maybe they started out as, you know, a death metal band or whatever this would be considered and then slowly incorporated more orchestral elements? Because um, I can see both sides. There's a couple of sections where more of the classical elements were pushed to the side and we got more of a straightforward metal section. And yeah, the growls, the double bass kicks, the speed, the brutality, they are all on point when they were given center stage as well. Neither side of the classical versus metal uh, elements are diminished from this. Yes, the classical elements do take the spotlight. They're utilized the most throughout the band, uh, throughout the song. The metal elements were sparingly used. Uh, there were a couple of sections that had them, and there was only one section that focused on it. 
But when they got brought out, they got brought out for reals. I don't know why I said that. But yeah, they they were not, uh, you know, done halfway or anything like that. If you take that section and extrapolate it to a whole song, you have a pretty standard death metal track. Uh, Like I said, they're not... They're they're proficient at writing and playing metal. They're proficient at writing and playing classical. And it's just phenomenal to see both of these ideas coming together in such a strong way where neither one of them's diminished. They actually both buttress and, uh, you know, raise up each other. And the song is just a phenomenal, phenomenal work because of it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, the last thing I want to mention is uh, more of a footnote. Just including synths in it as well is, uh, I, I, I don't know. I just really like that. We, <laughs> it's like we have peanut butter and, and chocolate and we've made this amazing, you know, Reese's bar, Reese's cup. And who knew these two things could go together so well? I mean, we all knew it. Classical and metal just work so well together. But who knew these two things could go to well together? But then someone found something else to add to it, like peanuts or something, uh, and that happened to be the synth. The synth adds so much atmosphere, I would say, to what's going on here. In the moments where it really is given some space to shine, which is usually more of the uh, subdued, sparse sections where there's actually space to hear this smaller sound because the guitars, the strings, the choirs, they're all huge, right? They're large sounds. So when it's actually given the chance to spotlight and be heard, I think it does a phenomenal job at atmosphere building. It adds to every section it's present in, even if it isn't heard in every section it's present in. And I think it's just one of those little nice touches where if it wasn't there, you wouldn't notice. Right? The song would still be phenomenal, but because it's there, it's that extra oomph. It's the difference between like an 85, sorry, a 95 and a 98 out of 100. Like, 95 is still practically perfect. You're, you're, you're almost at that 100%. 98 is still pretty much at that 100%, but it's, still, it's, a, it's a little bit better. And that's kind of what I see here. Uh, you know, the song definitely does not need it to be a, as amazing as it is, but I am so glad it's there. It adds so much little character that, uh, that wouldn't have been there without. So, 40-minute video. <laughs> <laughs> for a 12 minute song uh yeah i gushed about this one a bit i will have to listen to more for sure but for now those are my thoughts on disembodiment by shadow empire shade empire sorry this is where you guys come in though hit me up in the comments let me know if you enjoyed it or not let me know if there's anything else i should be checking out from them give me a place to start for sure because i will be checking more more stuff from them this is right up my alley. It is all the stuff I love about classical music with the stuff I love, I'm growing to love about metal. So, uh, yeah, I think this is a, a perfect little bridge into that. And like I said, there's a few bands that I enjoy sort of despite them having growls. Um, Vinter C comes to mind. I, I love listening to them, even if the growling isn't necessarily my cup of tea. But this, I mean, I would love to listen to this without the vocals. I I, I don't think I've ever said that before. I, I kind of think it's blasphemous in a sense. The song was created with them. Obviously, the band thought the song needed them. They obviously improved the song in some way, uh, according to the artist. Who am I to say that that should be taken out? But it is the part that grates on me the most because it is a very harsh growl. But despite that, I would listen to it every day. I would absorb those growls just to listen to the music because it is that good. Um, so yeah, the comments. When you're, <laughs> I, I, If given the chance, I will continue to tangent until this is a one hour video because I have... I could gush about this band forever. I really could. Just this one song. <laughs> I'm already adoring them. Um, comments. Description box. There's some links in there for stuff adjacent to the channel. Maybe you would like to help support the channel through Patreon and help vote on future songs and themes. Maybe you want to join Discord and chat with me and the rest of the community. Maybe you just want to check out the Twitter. Subscribe to me up there. Follow me on Twitter and see what I tweet about there. 
Um, like, subscribe, ring the bell. That's under the description box. I'll be back tomorrow at 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time at 10 p 9 p.m. UTC with the final orchestral instruments, great usage in music that is metal <laughs> week. And uh, until next time, remember to be critical, not cynical, of the music you listen to. And have a fantastic morning, afternoon, or evening whenever you choose to watch my videos. Thank you.